Let's talk about Mythigo Wood by Robert Holdstock. Now, look, some of our favourite books and series are... Uh, other people don't seem to have heard of, uh, do they? they? You say, I love this book, I love this author, and they, you know, someone else who likes the same stuff as you do, reads a lot of fantasy or sci-fi or classics or whatever, says to you, I've uh, never heard of it, sorry. Uh, I'd love to read it when I've got time. But this thing you love, no one else knows about. And this phenomenon, that often things we love in... Uh, particularly in genre fiction, are barely known by other people, was proven to me by, amongst other things, uh, Mythigo Wood by Robert Holdstock. It is, I think, it's a cycle, technically, I should say, uh, the Mythigo Wood or Riot Wood cycle, seven books in total. It's expanded this original book from a novella, and uh, it's it's hard to, to describe. I'll, I'll give it a go in a second, but I think the first thing to say um, is that this is possibly the best book series, in fantasy at least, that you've never read. It is a cycle, really, rather than a series. There's connections and recurring themes and places, not really a specific running plot and cast. Cast does recur, but the point of the series is not, oh well, you know, now our heroes are back on their one big epic journey. It's really that the wood, Riot Wood, is the subject, the hero. Or whatever you want to call it. I mean, whether it's a hero is a uh, up for debate. And this particular book, Mythigo Wood, look at that uh, beautiful cover. This particular, which is a bit like an Archimboldi uh, cover, isn't it? This particular book is about a young man returning from war, from the Second World War, to find his father's disappeared and his brother has gone a bit peculiar. And it's obviously all to do with the neighbouring wood his father was always obsessed with. So two thirds of the book is that our viewpoint character, Stephen, is him investigating the wood, it's him investigating the quasi-scientific theories his father had about the wood. Stephen becomes entangled in the magic of the wood, and in the final third he goes into the wood. To give you a, some sense of the immediate strangeness of this book, uh, the immediately startling nature of this book, let's, uh, let me read from the first page of, of chapter one. This is a page that Stephen has torn from his father's diary. A letter from Watkins agrees with me that at certain times of the year the aura around the woodland could reach as far as the house. Must think through the implications of this. He's keen to know the power of the oak vortex that I've measured. What to tell him? Certainly not of the first mythigo. I've noticed too that the enrichment of the pre-mythago zone is more persistent, but concomitant with this. I'm distinctly losing my sense of time. What on earth is going on? Well, what's special about this? Uh, the immediate strangeness of that, the fact that there's this thing about an oak vortex and mythigos, um, all these strange new terms and the fact there's a scientific investigation into a magic, I should say there's something special here. Holstock is writing fantasy, but one thing says it's almost literary fantasy. But there's no distant or ironic style, there's no um, archness, other semi-literary fantasy or literary fantasy can have just a degree of distance from the reader. It can have just a degree of, I suppose, the hyper-intellect going into it. With Holstock, there's never that feeling. It's organic. It's direct. It's written um, in a very ordinary, flat style, in one sense. It, <laughs> when you get into it and you realise what he's capable of stylistically, um, you wouldn't say that, but certainly up front it's very organic and direct. As I say, it's direct, but it's also dreamlike. It's dense text, knotty ideas. Uh, you almost have to, like with a magic eye puzzle, unfocus your eyes to, <laughs> to see the whole sometimes. And the central idea, basically, to, for the wood, is that human minds form a sort of fairyland of folk memory in deep ancient woods. Where there are deep and ancient woods, humans can form folk memories that live in those woods. Um, the oldest mythigos, that's what they're called, therefore are the oldest memories of human history. They can go all the way back, all the way back to the Ice Ages and beyond. And that's weird, but it's, it's special as well, isn't it? It's a fantastic concept. It's mind-bending. It's intellectually engaging. It's almost like Terry Pratchett's comedy idea of religion, that gods get their power from the number of believers they have. But there's something more here, something stranger. Holstock seems to almost believe uh, that mythigos exist, um, a bit like how uh, when you read C.S. Lewis, Lewis talking about 
how old people used to believe in this particular kind of cosmos. Uh, you can tell Lewis believes in that old kind of cosmos uh, with the spheres of the heavens. And Holstock almost seems to believe in mythagos in the same way. He seems to believe that the scientific methods used by some of his characters is almost valid. It's Tolkienian. It's a creator who seems to really buy into their sub-creation. But in one sense, in the dreamlike, hypnotic sense, it's more than Tolkienian. Um, it's not simply him writing the history of the land, but almost a, a mystic experience. And the sense of discovery is incredible. The sense of a world unfolding, of worlds unfolding, of ages unfolding. And the characters and their relationships. Uh, the brothers, their dead father, the ally that they find, uh, the love interest. These are uh, people. Uh, the ally they find is a um, an old fighter pilot from the war who has uh, been wounded. He's called Harry and he ends up wanting to go into the wood as well, having had an experience like it in the past. So he goes in with Stephen. And Harry is a great character, this ally. Um, the love interest. These are people, people we have met people who are somehow are us entering into the strange world of the wood um, is nothing like it that I've read uh, apart from its sequel are there weaknesses well yes I suppose you could say one and this is maybe a taste or or mood thing the prose is dense and heavy that's part of its effect but it also can be alienating the structure is intelligent, but also awkward. Progress is uneven. It's hard to know what to expect. Um, I, I remember finding this when I first watched Pom Poco, directed by Isao Takahata, that it's not at all the film you think it is from the first two thirds or even three quarters of the film. Um, the tonal shifts in a different style of filmmaking to what I was used to um, were things that initially made me very confused, even though I loved the film. My favourite Ghibli film, in fact. And I think the same thing's going on here, uh, that there is a different thing being built here. You have to get uh, used to it, a bit like reading The Silmarillion. And it does like polish at times. Holstock had published many books before, but there's a special kind of polish that comes with full maturity of style. And for that, we're going to have to wait for the pseudo-sequel, Le Vondis, uh, which many people would say is the best book in the cycle. So two of these books are in the Golanx Fantasy Masterwork series. One has a blurb by Neil Gaiman. These are special and important books. Um, it's a shame that more of them aren't more easily available. Uh, as I say, I love the art here at least. Um, it's a shame more of them aren't available. Holstock himself died in 2008, I believe. 2009, I believe. Um, and so we won't get any more. It's a compact series. And I think... Many people think with the last book he published in it, uh, not long before he died, he'd accomplished, uh, yeah, really not the end game of the cycle. He could have written more, but he had given a whole. Um, there are so many angles into the wood. There's so many routes. Do you go by the river, uh, the river routes? Do you go uh, through the oak grove? Do you go through the thick pine woods? Which fields do you cross? Um, <laughs> and when you get, I mean, uh, yeah, the the things that happen... Um, uh, particularly uh, when you read both this and, and its sequel, Levondis. I, I cannot recommend enough coming to this series and giving it an effort, not giving up if you're alienated by the strangeness or the relative slowness of this first book, but instead uh, surrendering to the wood, accepting that uh, to go in you have to uh, take a long journey. And then the incredible things that will happen, I, I almost... It's so hard not to find a single section to read. I mean, there's certainly some crazy weird things I can think of and be like, man, if I told people about that, they'd think it was interesting. But also uh, not wanting to spoil things. Uh, just the uh, the oddities that, that come up. Um, here, I'm just flicking something where they're in the ruin of a Roman villa talking to some Saxons. Um, <laughs> it does somehow get away with the joke um, of a Saxon woman saying Drukhtan, I'm sorry, it's all Saxon to me. But this idea of uh, of these different fragments of our folk memory that pop up in new and fresh and terrifying ways, and uh, done on the whole in a very successful way with rich and deep characters and deep relationships, very good relationships. So with that said, uh, I'll leave it there. If you haven't read it, you ought to. Uh, but if you have read it. 
tell me what you think in the comments. Till next time.